Good morning, everyone. You are very welcome to the session Careers in Medicine, Dentistry and Pharmacy organized by the Office of Intramural Training and Education at the NIH. My name is Elena Hernandez Ramon. I am the director of the Pre-Medical Program at NIH and I will be your moderator today. I'd like to thank you for being here. Uh, virtually is always uh, sometimes tricky, but sometimes better. So thank you for being here. I'd like to thank my colleague, Dr. Wang, who is going to be helping us with questions. I'd like to thank the interpreters here. Thank you so much for being here. And of course, I want to thank the outstanding panelists we have today. Um, they're going to start introducing themselves and we're going to proceed to your questions. If you need the closed captions, please go to the CC button uh, in the I think, lower part of your um, menu and you can have closed captions for you. Okay, so let's start with the introductions and then we'll go ahead with the questions. Can we start with you, Dr. Demisha Rankin? Uh, good morning and thank you for having me uh, here as a panelist. My name is Dr. Demisha Rankin. I am an associate professor at The Ohio State University. Uh, I am also um, the associate dean for admissions over the College of Medicine and I'm very happy to be here today. Great, thank you. So can we proceed with uh, Dr. Asadi Erfani? Hi, uh, hi everyone, I'm Azza Erfani. I'm a pharmacist. I graduated in May 2020. Fantastic. Uh, please, uh, Dayan Weirspoon. What is the sorry? Hi, my name is uh, Dr. Darian Weatherspoon. I'm a program official at the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research. Uh, my background, I'm a dentist and I've done uh, specialty training in dental public health. So I'm happy to be here today. Great, thank you very much. Uh, please, Dr. Crystal Walker. Hi, good morning. My name is Crystal Walker and I'm currently a clinical pharmacist in um, two types of pharmacy settings. I work in retail pharmacy and hospital pharmacy for CVS Health and I am a pharmacist at Anne Arundel Medical Center in the employee pharmacy. So I've been a pharmacist for about 15 years. Fantastic, thank you very much. Um, I have another name here, Dr. Erika Bar, if you can help me. I have the discourse but I don't see him um, here. Is is there anyone replacing him? Um, I don't know, Dr. Erika Bar, is there? Um, I see, I, I think we are all introduced, right? Jackie, is that correct? And as a day, just, hi, okay. Elena, it's as a day there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, she introduced herself already. Yeah, I have on my list a doctor of various courses, but I don't see him here. I, I just wanted to make sure I'm not missing anyone. No, you're fine. That's totally fine. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the introductions and for being here. Oh, I think Dr. Freddy Scorsia is just joining right now. So, hi, Dr. Scorsia, good morning. If you want to introduce yourself briefly, we're going to start with questions after the introduction. Great. Uh, sorry about that. My other meeting, of course, ran late because this is the time that we live in. Um, my name is Freddy Escorsi. I'm an MD-PhD um, uh, assistant clinical investigator here at the NCI, uh, and I study, um, uh, we try to build uh, tumor imaging agents and tumor therapeutic agents. Sounds very fantastic. So, we're going to start asking our participants or the audience to type questions in the question and answer box. I will have some questions for you to start with and then we'll go ahead and read the other questions. So the first question I have for you is, what are some programs that community college students can participate in that will prepare them for health professions? And, you know, you want to think about probably include community college um, um, enrichment program, is HPED or other programs that you know? Whoever wants to start, Dr. Uh Sure, I, I can start. And again, my background, I'm a dentist, and so I've gone to dental school. Um, and I actually took a few years uh, after college before applying to dental school, so I didn't start right away. And I had to um, 
make sure I participated in um, uh, exper experiences that, uh, shadowing experiences that really taught me about dentistry. And so one of the first things I did was to contact my local dental school. So I graduated from the University of Maryland and I found out that they had a summer program um, that was a couple days long and it gave students who were interested in applying to dental school um, the opportunity to kind of learn about um, like some of the current um, issues in dentistry and some of the, um, uh, the current technologies and, and some of the, the innovations in dentistry. And so that was kind of a starting point for me in terms of uh, programs where I could kind of get my face out there so that admission staff knew who I was, knew that I was interested, um, and also really provided me with um, a lot of information just about the profession of dentistry that I wasn't aware of. Um, so I, I would recommend that if students are interested, um, depending whether you're medical school, pharmacy school, um, den dentistry, um, to contact a local um, professional, health professional school and see if there are any um, programs that the school has that might um, uh, uh, get, get you acclimated and uh, provide you with some information. And I'm sure everyone else has, there's other uh, um, opportunities as well. So I'll let the panel discuss some of those. I'll jump in. Um, uh, thank you for that. And I'll add to that. So I, I, my, again, my path is uh, I've attended medical school. And so things that uh, I would, in addition to seeking out information about the process, I would encourage students to get involved in their community and identify mechanisms that they can display their leadership skills as well as teamwork skills. And so that can come in many different forms, whether it be through volunteering, whether it be through leadership, uh, through um, any Greek organization that you may be or may not be affiliated, may be affiliated with, um, your church, um, any, any opportunities to really be a leader, to give back and serve your community can be very, very helpful to not only demonstrate your leadership, but as well as your, your team um, building skills and advocacy. I'd like to thank you, especially in this time. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Walker. Yes, I'd also like to add, um, so my career path was um, a little different as well. also. I started with um, a degree in biology. And so I was kind of unsure of the direction that I wanted to go. So what I did was I started working on a master's degree um, just to kind of stay um, relevant and kind of stay on top of everything. And then just kind of seeking out information um, Definitely with volunteering. I think that's the biggest thing, especially with pharmacy, because there's so many different areas of pharmacy that not a lot of people are aware of. So just volunteering at the local um, local pharmacy, a hospital pharmacy, just getting the most information that you can. I think that's a great way to start and kind of see is it something that you want to do and just seek out mentors. I think that's the biggest, the most important thing is, um, you know, a lot of people, they enjoy, you know, directing and guiding um, students to kind of um, help them de determine their career path. So I think um, a mentor is definitely um, a big advantage also. Great, anyone else? Any other comment about that? Yes, go ahead, Dr. So Tom. I was a, a pre-pharmacy student at Howard Community College, Maryland. And through Community College Day, NIH Community College Day, so I um, applied for CSEP program at the NIH and I got the internship uh, in two, uh, tw uh, 2015. Uh, it was a great opportunity for me because uh, through my internship, first of all, I learned about basic science. Uh, also through a lot of workshop, great workshop, I learned how to apply for graduate school and learn about pharmacy. I built my network um, and also I had the opportunity to visit the NIH pharmacy and got a, a volunteer a volunteer job. And I was there for about four or five years, basically until last year. And um, it helped me a lot uh, for my admission to pharmacy school. Fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. It looks like a short period of time, but that can change your perspective, right? Anyone else? Can we proceed to the next question? We, we have some specific questions, but I'd like to start with this more general question. How did you get all into your careers? 
<laughs> well, I'll Let's jump in start. on that one yes. too. Uh, <laughs> So uh, I am an anesthesiologist by training and uh, in medical school, you know, the curriculum is set up to be able to allow you to experience different aspects of medicine. And I loved everything. Like I, I loved everything. And so I think um, a student's experiences um, matched with what your particular skill sets are will help you inform the path. For instance, um, I am, I like order and I like uh, things to be arranged in a certain way. And so that those kind of skill sets of organization and multitasking and being able to prioritize serve me very well when I have patients that are very sick, very critical, and really being able to work through things very quickly. And so I think for me, it was just a matter of, again, aligning my particular strengths um, with my interests and um, really just identifying uh, 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 an area that when I'm doing it, it doesn't feel like a job. Like it really is very, very rewarding. And so I think that is something that you'll find amongst all of us that really enjoy what we do. It's not necessarily a job. It does have significant responsibility, but being true to your passions are, are very important. Fantastic. Who wants to go next? That's for everyone, right? Um, for me, I think um, it started um, where I wasn't sure what, what I wanted to be. I didn't know anything about pharmacy. I remember being an undergrad thinking I wanted to go to medical school or go to dental school because I knew I wanted to be a healthcare professional, but I wasn't sure um, the path that I wanted to go. And I think the most important thing is to know that you're not going to know what you want to do the rest of your life at 20, 21 years old. But the key is to know what your strengths are and kind of just get the most information that you can. So for me, I knew I wanted to be a healthcare professional. Um, I stayed in school and I asked a lot of questions. And I, like I said before, I did a lot of volunteering. And so I kind of um, realized that pharmacy was the right um, path for me. And then also my career has been evolving. So I've been a pharmacist for about 15 years now. And so I'm kind of at a point in my life where I'm wanting to transition into becoming um, more of a public health professional. So kind of focusing on lifestyle medicine um, and what's called de-prescribing, which is getting patients off of medicines through lifestyle management and nutrition education. So I'm actually working on a, um, a master of public health and nutrition. So um, currently, like I said, my career is evolving. And I think that that is one thing to be able to accept that you know, it's not going to, you're not going to have the answer at a certain point in your life. It's just kind of, it's constantly changing. Very good point. Who wants to go next? I think, I think one point I'll just mention, and um, it's kind of been brought up, but I think it's one of the benefits of shadowing um, is that you get to really experience, you know, what it's like. And I would just recommend um, that all students, um, kind of take a diverse approach to shadowing, um, you know, within the healthcare profession nowadays, especially there's several different subspecialties and different ways of practicing. Um, so I think it's beneficial to kind of um, um, look at different um, types of uh, practice in your uh, healthcare area of interest. Um, I know as a dentist, if you shadow um, a general dentist versus like an orthodontist or a public health dentist, um, you know, while we have similarities, um, there's a lot of um, kind of nuances to each specialty. And so I think it's good when you shadow just to kind of um, get some variety so you kind of understand kind of the, the opportunities that are available. And, you know, my path, I'm a public health uh, dental specialist. And so I'm kind of more on the research end. We don't have a lot of people who kind of go that route. So, uh, but there's a lot of opportunity. So um, I think, you know, um, Shadowing is important, but you also want to get a good variety of um, um, experiences when you shadow. Hey, fantastic. Yeah, go ahead, Dr. Discussion. Uh, yeah, so for me, it was interesting. Um, uh, I, I had some exposure to medicine because my parents are physicians. They're, we're immigrants, so it's a whole other story, which we, we can get into if you guys like. But, um, you know, because they work so hard to reestablish themselves as physicians here, I actually didn't want to do medicine. So I wanted to avoid it like the, the plague. Maybe that's not no longer a thing we should be saying these days, right? But, um, but no, so, you know, 
in, in when I when I applied to college, I went pre med just sort of because I liked science and I wanted to help people. And I didn't know what grad school was. Um, I went to a lot of these panels. There's a lot of um, uh, pre med uh, organizations that had panels, and you know, eventually I became aware of the, the possibility of like what grad school was. I had no idea what grad school was. Uh, and, and everything. So I think keeping your ear to the ground, figuring out what the different possibilities are there, um, you might be able to find your niche, you could explore it. You know, I think having mentors out there and seeing, uh, you know, vis visiting an, enough of a diverse type of uh, different type of organizations and, you know, summer programs, things like that can help you figure out whether you like these things. You know, um, there's plenty of people that wanted to be a physician and they're like, all right, let me check that box for the research. They're like, I'm good. I don't have to go to grad school, right? Uh, and, and that's okay. And I think figuring out what it is that you want to do uh, is, is an important part of, of, of the, the college experience. Fantastic. Dr. Fanny? So for me, I was always interested in the power of medications. Like you take one pill and you, you, you know, you get better. Um, so I started shadowing and then I interested, I became more and more interested in pharmacy. During the pharmacy school, I was dual degree. So I did master of palliative care and hospice as well. I just graduated in September. Um, uh, so for me, I haven't started working, but wherever I'm going to go, uh, really I want to make positive impact in the life of patients. So if they have less pain, makes me more happy. <laughs> Very good. So I think we observe in everyone passion and excitement. And I think that that is something very clear that, that you need to have, right? Okay, so I'm going to start with some more particular questions and then we'll go from there. Uh, we have a question about um, a program. Is molecular biology and biotechnology a good program for pre-med and I would say also for pre-dental, pre-pharmacy? What do you think? I would say yes. Um, I, and at the same time, I would say that choose whatever major um, that you want to pursue. There is, There are many pathways to get to whatever pre-health program you want to get to, but your experiences should really inform your decision. And you don't have to major in a science so long as you um, uh, prepare your schedule or, or create a schedule that allows you to fulfill the prerequisites for whatever pathway you're going to be choosing, you can major in anything. Um, and in fact, um, some of those individuals that major in art or history or music really bring a, or, or Spanish or public health or engineering, they really bring um, unique perspectives for, way of, for ways of solving problems. Um, which is what we need in terms of individuals pursuing pre-health programs. And so, yes, the sciences are fantastic if that's what you want to major in, but by no means are you required to major in a science to apply to any pre-health program so long as you fulfill your requirements for prerequisites. Good. Any additional comment about that? Is that the same for the other programs? So I was a pre-pharmacy at um, Howard Community College um, and I did just my prerequisite and applied for pharmacy school. Fantastic. I definitely think that um, being more well-rounded is definitely an advantage. And I remember being in pharmacy school, I, I was a science major, so um, that did help me. But um, a lot of my classmates were history majors, were you know psychology majors. Um, I think the key is to know that um, it will not limit you. The biggest thing is to make sure you know your strengths and you know you know what your prerequisites are and you know what your um, what what is required for the program. But um, I think that it is potentially an advantage because you're bringing a unique perspective to the program. Great. Let's go to a, another. Is there any additional comment about that? Okay, I think everybody agrees on, on the same uh, kind of answer. So there is a question, also a general question about how, how do we find or seek out mentors? Anybody wants to start with that one? Sure. 
I'll jump in. Um, I think it is important to realize that mentors come in all shapes and sizes. And so um, as an African-American woman, when I was going through my path for medicine, there were not necessarily individuals that looked like me. Um, but there's, that's not to say that I didn't have individuals that were supportive of me and provided me guidance, um, sponsorship, mentorship, and so I think um, it is helpful to try and identify uh, maybe someone that you in an area that you're interested in, uh, potentially uh, a work study position could blossom into a, a mentor uh, relationship. Um, if someone has a lab, someone that you've shadowed, really just doing your research and being genuine and forming um, this mentor relationship. And I think you have to be careful with that too, because just like you wouldn't walk up to a guy or a girl and say, hey, you want to be my boyfriend or girlfriend? You can't do that with mentors either because it takes a little bit of relationship building. And I think initially it starts off as more of an advisor role. And then over time you get to know and form that mentoring relationship. And I think it's also important to realize that a mentor, you may have more than one because not one person can fill all of your needs. And so it may be research related. It may be um, someone that you're you know, playing some sports. Um, so there, there's mentors come in many, many shapes and um, they don't have to look like you. While it is nice to see someone doing, someone that looks like you doing something that you want to do, but I would say open your mind and, and that Mentors come in many shapes and sizes. Any additional comment about mentors? Okay, all happy. Let's continue with the questions then. Are there some more specific questions? Let's see. Are there careers for registered nurses in pharmacy? What about dentistry? What kind of further uh, education would be required? Um, so, so with the, the, the question was if there's any further education that's required for dentistry? I guess registered nurses in pharmacy, nurses in dentistry. Oh, nurse, nurses. Nurses, oh, okay. yeah. um, So, you know, I haven't seen a lot of, um, you know, nurses uh, transition specifically towards dentistry. Um, but I will say that nurses, I think, have an amazing, you know, skill set um, and just a general healthcare skill set. And um, one of the things that's kind of, I guess, changing a little bit with dentistry is it's becoming less about, you know, operating on just teeth and it's becoming uh, more about kind of patient-centered care. And so we're, as dentists, collaborating with um, physicians and um uh, nurses and pharmacists, and so we're really becoming more integrated into the greater healthcare uh, uh, system. And so I think the skill sets that nurses bring um, could definitely transition to a career in dentistry. Um, some of the things that you, you know, um, treating the whole patient and, and kind of understanding the health impacts of certain conditions and, and you know, what the um, the systemic implications of those conditions are. Um, we definitely see impacts in the oral health um, status of patients. So I think as nurses, um, you definitely have a skill set that if, if there was interest in dentistry or going to dental school, that would make you um, very unique and, and um, um, uh, very competitive uh, as, um, for, uh, for a dental career. So. I'd like to piggyback off of that um, with pharmacy. I agree a thousand percent. Um, one thing with the career of pharmacy, it has um, it has changed over probably over the last 20 years where a pharmacist is um, less involved in um, basically just filling prescriptions and having just a more clinical background. Um, and so I think um, a nurse background will definitely uh, also bring the clinical skills to pharmacy. There's a lot of clinical pharmacists that work alongside physicians, alongside dentists, alongside um, nurse practitioners um, um, in the hospital setting. So that's something that a nurse um, background would have an advantage over. Um, 
this is to piggyback off what everybody has said so far, but I, I noticed there's another question in the, in the Q&A about uh, somebody planning to go to nursing school before applying to medical school. Um, well, that's fine, and, and I know plenty of nurses who've become uh, physicians themselves. Uh, I, I think you have to sort of, that doesn't necessarily mean it's an advantage or a disadvantage. If that's what you want to do, that's one thing, but you have to ask yourself whether you want to be a nurse or whether you want to be a physician, because they're distinct careers, right? And it's, it's okay for that transition and change over time, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to do one before the other. So if you want to do nursing and what that entails, understand what the field is, do your research, maybe talk to some, uh, some folks that are in nursing and see what their day-to-day -day looks like. But if you're also interested in medicine, see what that looks like, and then you can compare and choose for yourself uh, because they are distinct. Um, so just, just a note. Very good comments. Then let's go ahead, we have a lot of questions. Let's see how much we can cover. What skills, techniques did you find helpful to maintain your focus on becoming who you are today? For me, I think um, growing up in a single parent home um, as the oldest child, uh, I think I was forced to develop a skill set that allowed me to be able to navigate spaces that were unfamiliar and uncharted. Um, and so I think for me, the biggest thing has been confidence um, and not, not arrogance, but simply confidence in myself and in my skin um, and um, in being able to say, I deserve to be here. I'm just as good as the next person. Um, not better, but just as good and just as capable. And it's not a matter of knowing everything or trying to get everything right. It's just, it's a matter of being comfortable in your own skin, uh, being using mistakes or obstacles as opportunities for growth and development and understanding that everyone goes through that. No one knows everything. And I think confidence is something that I developed early on um, and I think that has, that has served me very well. And so that is one thing that I would encourage students to, um, to, to think about as you're thinking about where is it that you want to go, um, know that you can do it where there's a will, there's a way it might take you a little longer. You know, you may have to go half time to school. Uh, you may have to work while you're doing it, but everything that you're doing on a daily basis should be adding to you reaching your ultimate goals. And so I think be patient with yourselves, be confident in yourselves, reach out for help when you need help. Um, there's a reason that there are communities and um, resources because you really can't do it on your own. But again, having that confidence to speak up and say, hey, I need help or hey, I need guidance is very, very important. Okay, thank you. Very important skill to develop, right? Anybody else? I have one last thing to add. Um, I think one thing that we um, we as people like to do is com com compare ourselves to other people. And um, as you said, the, your path is always different from everyone else. So that's, I think, the biggest um, disservice we do to ourselves if we compare our path to someone else's. Um, and then it'll allow us to not have the confidence to, to move forward. So I think the key is just to stay on your own path. Um, and just know that um, everyone's path is different. Very nice. Okay, let's move uh, on with the next question. And also one or two people, if, if you want to answer, what does your day to day work look like pre and during COVID? Mm. I'm gonna stop jumping in first at some point, but I'm gonna <laughs> just go ahead and go for it. So I wear many hats. So as an anesthesiologist, I'm not Zooming. I have to go into the hospital and I'm taking care of patients. Um, and that, as the anesthesiologist, we are kind of like the pilots on the plane when we were flying pre-COVID and during COVID, quite frankly, um, where I get there early, like 6 a.m. Sounds crazy but you want your pilot to make sure they check out the plane, make sure there's gas, make sure all the buttons and the equipment work. And so when I go in, I see my patients, uh, I make sure everything is set up and I take them on their trip from point A to point B, which means they need to get through surgery. And so um, I put them to sleep, um, I keep them asleep, 
and then I wake them up. And so while that is an oversimplification, it is much like, again, taking off on an airplane, things can go wrong. Um, and I'm there to make sure that doesn't happen. And then once we get in flight, then the surgeon can turn some music on in the operating room. You know, you can let down your tray table. Uh, and then when it's time to land, tray table goes up, you know, you put your electronic devices away and you prepare for landing. And so as the anesthesiologist, that's what my day is like. And I love it because I get to meet lots of people. Um, and I have to be able to form relationships with them very quickly because most people aren't afraid of their surgery. They know their surgeon, they're meeting me for the very first time. And so that hat is very fun. In light of COVID, it has been very, very challenging because um, as an anesthesiologist, not only do we take care of patients in the operating room, but we also are in the ICU and critical care units. And so um, at my particular hospital, we are responsible for putting the breathing tubes in for all patients. Um, and as you guys know, COVID affects your breathing. And so um, that becomes very, very challenging. Um, and, but I think it speaks to the um, selfless nature of anyone that's pursuing any pre-health and, and that we are giving of ourselves and using our talents to help other people. So that's my anesthesiologist day. I will not hog all this because I also wear the admissions dean role where I'm interviewing students now in this virtual format. And so they're applying to medical school. They're trying to figure out where they want to go. And that's awesome and that's fun, but I think it's scary too, because um, again, you're, you're Zooming <laughs> from another city uh, for a, a school in Columbus, Ohio. Hold on, true. Yeah, anybody else, Dr. Descorsi? Yeah, so I'm an oncologist, so um, you know we do see patients and that, that, that kind of work doesn't, doesn't necessarily stop uh, given the pandemic. Um, that said, you know, I work in a, a very um, particular type of place at the NIH. Uh, and because of that, uh, the patient volume, that is the number of patients that we see as, a, as, a, as an institution is very low compared to a, a regular hospital, for example, um, because every patient that comes in is on a clinical trial. That is, they're trying new things that, um, that we don't know whether, whether they'll, they work, right? Um, so, uh, so, you know, I do, I, 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 ha, I have had to come in and see patients, you know, masked up, gowned up the whole nine. Uh, we do have to treat some patients that are COVID positive, right? Uh, just because you have cancer doesn't mean you can't get this, this, the, the, the pandemic. And in some cases it might make you more susceptible. Um, so yeah, so it, it, it definitely changes the, the rapport you can build with patients because you don't have the same nonverbal cues, right? You don't, you don't see people smile, you, they don't see you smile. And it's a little bit trickier to, to build that. Um, so, you know, we've come up with other ways to do it. Um, I also run a lab, as I mentioned before, and that's been tricky because we actually shut down for a while. So nobody was coming in. Um, I'm relatively early in the phase uh, of, of starting a lab. And uh, when, when folks are trying to do that, it requires a lot of uh, time in to build that body of work, get the momentum going, figure out the particular uh, protocols to get stuff going. So that, that definitely put a hamper on, on our ability to, you know, produce data and, and get papers out. Great. Anybody else? Okay. I'll just mention that I'm, right now I'm not practicing clinical dentistry, um, so I'm more, more overseeing research, um, but I know in dentistry, um, pre-COVID to now um, with COVID, there have been some pretty significant changes. Um, obviously, we have a lot more PPE um, and volume is a lot lower, um, but in dentistry, we generate a lot of aerosols, and so that can um, spread um, infection. And so um, a lot of our procedures have been shifted more towards prevention when possible. It's not always possible, but um, there are um, some um, procedures that we can perform where we're not using the handpiece, which is, you know, potentially generating aerosol. And so I think there has been some uh, shift to uh, clinical dental practice um, um, now that we're dealing with this pandemic. Um, but again, I, I think, um, you know, in dentistry, we've always been um, 
uh, very particular about infection control. So um, procedurally, a lot hasn't really changed, but our volumes change. And, and uh, again, our shift towards prevention ha has definitely um, changed. The other thing that I've noticed in dentistry is we're using a lot more um, teledentistry or telehealth. So um, we're not always able to use it, but in certain cases where we can communicate with patients um, via settings such as um, Zoom or any other remote setting and um, kind of make some initial diagnoses and, and communicate with patients and determine whether or not they actually need to come into a dental office, um, that's really uh, increased um, since, with, since the pandemic started. And I'll add really quickly, um, in the field of pharmacy, we work directly with the community. So one of my initial concerns with COVID um, was, um, you know, overall transmission. And one thing that we do is immunizations. Um, and so what I've noticed a uh, significant increase is in the number of flu shots that we're giving, um, which is a good thing because we're um, the, the, the community is being protected. But the biggest thing is that we have to make sure that we're protecting ourselves and I'm making sure my team is protected. So we're obviously using um, PPE and doing that um, but that's probably in the biggest um, the biggest changes in volume of people that are coming in for immunizations and just making sure that we're protected okay I think Dr. Fanny also wanted to add something is that correct um, so I haven't started working but during my rotation actually um, I was in John Hopkins so uh, we we were going to round every day and uh, we had a small meeting like short meeting 10 minutes and then we were going to uh, visit patient all the team together pharmacists and everyone else and uh, doctors but after the covid started so we stopped doing that basically just one or two of the residents going to the uh, patient room and then coming back and having a very very long meeting after that so basically we transitioned from being in the patient room for more time to being in the just meeting room and just discuss the patients. Very good, thank you. Thank you all for sharing your daily lives now with COVID. Okay, we have, we have several questions about shadowing, uh, volunteering at the clinical setting, what to do during these times. Do you have any advice about that? And we, we all know that for admissions, that's an important part of the application. And our students are not finding these opportunities. But there are other opportunities out there. So what, what is your perspective about that for I every think, program? Yeah. I think students are getting very creative and meeting the needs of their respective communities, whether it is uh, volunteering to assemble um, protection kits for the community, you know, masks and hand sanitizer or gloves or face shields or, um, you know, telemedicine. Telemedicine is not going anywhere. And I think we've had some hints of that even in the dentistry world. And so some of the shadowing experiences may not be in person because that's for your own health and protection because there is, there are individuals that are asymptomatic. And so um, linking up with the physician to be able to shadow them in the telemedicine world is something that we're seeing with our students and you know just it, students are getting very very creative and, and even using talents of sewing to be able to make masks for individuals um, or working with your local health department to do contact tracing uh, for COVID so students are getting very very creative and, and it's those students that use this pandemic <laughs> as an opportunity to really identify and fill a void that exists. Fantastic. Any additional comment? Yeah, I think that's a really good, that was a really good comment um, because I'm just thinking I'm not, um, you know, actively involved in any, any kind of shadowing. So I don't know how that would work. Um, my guess is that it would be much more difficult to shadow nowadays, um, and I'm talking mainly from a dental perspective because these are private offices that are smaller, um, and so bringing someone else in I think would probably be difficult, um, but I think the advice of, of being creative, I mean, I think there's lots of other ways to show, and especially during this um, a pandemic that, you know, I wasn't able to fully shadow my dentist, but um, I was able to, you know, work with the community and um, you know, deliver PPE, um, 
There's probably other ways um, through dental societies or other volunteer organizations where you could, um, you know, even I, I know some uh, places are developing um, health education materials to, to um, you know, because we can't see people in person as easily. So developing health education materials, um, those are all kind of creative ways where even if your shadow opportunities were limited, you can show that you've still been involved. Um, and so I, I uh, second that suggestion in terms of trying to be creative during this time. And one thing I will add um, about pharmacy is um, I, I currently work at a CVS inside of a Target, so I've had several situations where um, a, a, an individual was just a cashier um, at Target, but they were thinking about the medical field, so they've come to me and just asked me directly. And I think the key is to be comfortable asking questions. So asking um, if someone is willing to, you know, volunteer some of their time or, or be a mentor, or what are some ways that they can um, be a mentor, especially um, in the situation that we're in now. Um, and at, or at a hospital, you know, asking, um, starting at starting in, um, as a candy striper or, and you know what I mean? And just kind of deciding um, if you figure out if you're going to meet someone in a different area and just kind of starting from there. But I think the thing is a lot of people like to share what they know and to share what they do. So just asking questions and then just asking if they can't help you, if they know someone who can. If I could follow up on that, I think uh, reaching out to people, sort of putting yourself out there is going to be critical, right? Particularly, you know, I don't know about you guys, but maybe we share a similar background. We don't have that much in the way of connections. We sort of have to build it on our own. We can't lean on, you know, networks from our peers and families and things like that. So you kind of have to do it on your own. And the way to do these types of things is, is to actually put some effort behind it because for example, I get emails about people interested in working in the lab for summer. Do I have space, et cetera? Um, and some people do a really good job of reaching out and some people do a less good job, right? So you should put in a lot of effort to demonstrate that you did your homework. Like, hey, I saw that you went to University X or you went to so-and-so pharmacy school. I see you work at this place in this community. Show that you've done your homework, right? And then you already are standing up by virtue of having put in that effort. Because if you're putting in that much effort just to reach out, you might put in that much more effort when you're here and you're shadowing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Because otherwise I'll get emails, dear scientist, or uh, hello, comma. And then like, here's what I'm trying to do. Do you have space? And it's clear that it's a generic email and it just goes to show you that you haven't put in that effort. It may be that you're awesome, right? But that doesn't, that doesn't come across in that email or that, that, that the way they're reaching out, right? So that's something to keep in mind as you're doing this. We don't have a luxury of, you know, calling uh, or dad calling somebody on our behalf and like getting us that internship or whatever. But if you, if you do a good job, put yourself forward and, 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 and sort of, put in that homework kind, uh, I think it, it does pay dividends. Can I okay, one, thank you. Oh. Can I have one last thing? Um, just never underestimate the power of social media. And this is something that um, when I was in school that was not um, available, but LinkedIn is such a powerful tool. It allow you to connect with people all throughout the world. And um, it, your mentorship can be in the form of, you know, online. And that's something that um, that's an advantage of students for today is LinkedIn. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you so much. There are some very good questions here. I'd like to cover as many as possible. Do you think attending community college is a disadvantage for medical, dental, nursing school? Do schools really prefer students with credits from four-year schools rather than community college credits? I would say no. Again, there are many, many paths. There's not just one way to do things. And if you demonstrate mastery, um, in your courses, that meaning like you have a, a, a very sound GPA, you have very sound experiences, you demonstrate an ability to master the content on whatever standardized exam there is, then no, there's no disadvantage. I, I think that, again, you, you have to, what you were able to do with the resources that you have speaks more about mm -hmm. your perseverance, your determination, and your drive. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, we have a lot of students worried about that and we always encourage them to, to apply. We have seen all fantastic candidates, right? So of course you can do this, guys. All right. 
Anybody else, any additional comment about that? But I go to the next question, which I think is also very important. Okay, I move forward then. Um, I've seen several messages, um, questions about, you know, I, I love the science, but I don't know if I'm that good at that, or questions about, I, I'm afraid I can fail midway of doing it, and other que questions that really show that confidence that sometimes we need. Do you have any comment about that? Any, any time you felt this and how you overcame this feeling? One thing I will say for me is um, the key is to, again, like I said before, you cannot compare yourself to other students. I remember um, a specific example. I was in pharmacy school and um, there was a course that was so different. It was so difficult for me and I remember a lot of my classmates were able to kind of, you know, hang out and not really study as much and they would come in and do really well and I remember I was struggling, but I had to just become comfortable with the fact that, you know what, it just means I have to spend a little bit more time than everyone else to grasp the material, whether that means, you know, getting up earlier, staying up later, and um, it kind of you know, it, it kind of did a mind trick on me when I did compare myself to other people. But when I finally accepted, this is where I am, this is what I need to do to succeed. Um, um, independent of what everyone else was doing, I became more comfortable and I was able to succeed. So that's the biggest thing is you can't really compare yourself. So I have two daughters, um, 14 and 10. Well, she'll be 14 on Thanksgiving day on Thursday. In any case, mm -hmm. I tell them, I will never be upset as long as you have given your best effort and honestly given your best effort. And, and I say for each of your classes, you start off with an A. Keep it. Do what you need to do to learn it. And if it takes you a little longer, if you need more flashcards, if you need to work in a group, if you need whatever, highlight and circle, underline, capitalize, <laughs> whatever you need to do, but just give your best effort. And I, and I agree with you, Dr. Walker, don't compare yourself to other people. Just do what, give your best effort. And I think you can find comfort in that. And because I know that you're smart, I know that you're capable, I'm okay. And I think for me, thinking, thinking back to those kinds of classes, uh, one strategy, because I know we've all had those difficult classes, um, but I think, early on, like if you have a difficult class, um, usually there's, you know, access to TAs or even the professor, um, they have office hours. And so um, taking advantage of that early on, I think is really important because a lot of times, you know, just showing, again, going back to the effort, you know, showing that effort that you really, you know, want to succeed in this class. Um, you know, you are capable, as mentioned, um, sometimes classes will be harder for, for, for other people, you know, certain classes will be harder for you. Um, but um, I think, you know, kind of starting out early on in, in the semester with those types of classes and getting to know the TA, getting to know the professor, um, that can be very beneficial. And, um, um, again, you can kind of, um, you know, uh, get the help you need early, um, and I think you will be successful in those classes. And if I could just add to that um, mindset, make sure you're, you're approaching things with the right mindset and that you're not just simply learning it for this class, but anticipate that what you're learning will be built upon. So changing your mindset that I'm not just learning this material to take this test, I'm learning this material because I ultimately want to be a physician or a dentist or a pharmacist. And so this is going to help me. Granted, it might be small micro data, but it's all adding to it. So, so reframing your mindset and, and how you're approaching it and why you're learning it. Anybody else? I think this is a very important question. Any additional comment? Okay, I think we're good. All right, so let's, let's go to the next question. Let's see how many we can cover. Um, what is the best way to prepare to apply to medical, dental, pharmacy school, uh, dentistry, uh, when you have low stats, GPA, et cetera? What, what kind of programs do you recommend or experiences? 
Well, I'll tell my personal experience. Um, I remember um, being an undergrad, and as I stated before, I was a biology major, did not have the best grades. It took me a couple of years to become acclimated to the college experience. Um, and so I knew at, the, at that point, I wanted to go to medical school, but I knew that my grades were not sufficient to get into medical school. So what I decided to do was um, just for the effort of strengthening my academic background, I decided to pursue a master's degree in biology. And so it was while I was in this program that I was able to decide the, the direct path that was that was um, appropriate for me, but it also allowed me to kind of um, kind of reestablish my academic career um, and kind of be able to speak to, you know, the challenges that I had in undergrad and um, how I moved forward. So I was able to have a higher GPA in graduate school and I was able to subsequently get into pharmacy school. So I think, again, as I stated before, I couldn't compare myself to my classmates who were able to go to two years of pre-pharmacy school and then, you know, become admitted. That wasn't my path. And so I just had to become comfortable with knowing what my weaknesses were, learning what um, what I needed to work on and just kind of um, accepting the fact that, you know, maybe I need to continue to go to school in order to prove that, you know, I have the academic background to succeed. Great. Anybody else? Okay. I'll, I'll yes. just mention that I've had, um, I've had some classmates and um, who didn't have um, necessarily the best stats and um, you know, one strategy they used um, was just directly talking to the um, admissions offices and saying, you know, these, this is what I have right now. Um, like, what do I need to do to get in? Um, and I, I remember one student in particular told me um, his story, um, and he just, and you know, he talked to the admissions staff, and he was just, he told them, you know, I'm dedicated. I want to get in. I just want to know what I need to do. And they kind of gave him, you know, a path of, you know, some suggestions and he took those and um, did great. I think that, you know, they had recommended taking some additional advanced coursework, um, you know, retaking um, our standardized test, which is a DAT. And he did all that. And they actually remembered that, you know, he came to them and really, you know, asked them what he needed to do and was, you know, determined to get in and he um, succeeded at, at doing what they um, advised. And so I think that was, you know, what got him in. So again, I think it goes back to that determination. Um, and, you know, it, it may be a, a more challenging road, you know, you may have to, um, you know, do a master's program, you may have to retake um, some of the standardized um, exams, but um, if you're committed and dedicated, you could find a way. And, and I will say, putting on my admissions hat, I think that it, it certainly takes more than just a good GPA or a good um, performance on a standardized exam to be a good physician, pharmacist, dentist. Um, but this is not to um, overlook the requirements of exams. And this is a part of every specialty. And so the entrance exam, the standardized entrance exam is just one of many exams that you have to take. And so I do think that if you are told not yet, don't view it as simply no, view it as not yet. And I think it is important to think about how can I improve my application, whether it be through, you know, additional coursework where you demonstrate that 4.0 GPA, you know, yeah, maybe your GPA undergrad was 3.5, but and now you're going to get this 4.0. Realize that as you're approaching your studies, treat it as a full-time job. And most people who work a full-time job work 40 hours a week. So not saying that that is the magic number, but make sure you're, you're committed to your goals and you're being honest with your effort. And then don't be afraid to ask for feedback, like, okay, I didn't get in yet what can i do differently maybe i need more shadowing maybe i need more experiences maybe i need to you know um, explore some post baccalaureate training or programs so or maybe i need more research maybe i need to apply to more programs cast a wider net um again don't think it is, don't think of it as no just not yet the power of that so that's a very way to almost finished the session. Uh, we have very few minutes left. Actually, we need to um, finish before 11.30 because we all use the same account. So I have just a quick question uh, for, this, for the panelists because we have a lot of very specific questions for every one of you, for every single one of you. 
is there a way for you, if, if you are comfortable with, to share your email so they can approach you directly? So if you are comfortable with that, please go ahead in the chat and put your email there because I have questions for every single one of you and just wanted to you know, make sure the space was for more general questions, okay? Um, and looks like we don't have more time. Um, Phil, can you confirm that for me? I thought we were gonna finish 11, 11.30. Do we have time for a final thought or not? Um, I'm sorry, you do have time for a final thought, but we need to wrap up uh, right now for the next session. Okay, so if you can share, thank you so much. If you can share your emails, if you feel comfortable with that, and just final thought one by one, whoever wants to start. Um, I will say I'm happy to share my email address with you guys. Um, I will not be responding until after Thanksgiving. So you can wait <laughs> to send it until next week. Otherwise, it's going to be sitting out there. But I would just say be confident. Um, ask for help. And where there's a will, there's a way. Thank you. Who wants to go next? I'll also, um, I'm comfortable sharing my email. Please reach out to me if you have any questions about pharmacy, about any other career um, ways you can um, shadow. Um, I'm definitely open to being a mentor and um, confidence, I agree as well, is the, probably the biggest thing. Confidence and um, yeah, confidence. Mm -hmm. Great, who's next? Hurry up. So I'm happy to be a resource for anyone who's interested in dentistry or dental school. Um, and I echo uh, what's already been said about confidence and then um, also just echo um, determination. I think, you know, just you may, as mentioned, you may not make it that first time, but if you really want it, um, just uh, keep going for it. Perfect. Thank you. And I just sent my email to the chat and I'm happy to answer any question about pharmacy school and uh, jobs nowadays. Thank you, Dr. Fanny. Yes, Dr. Scott, yes. Yeah, um, I shared my email as well. I'm also Googleable by virtue of being a government employee that you can find us anywhere and probably get our, our personal cell phone numbers through there too. Um, yeah, uh, I think echoing what everybody said, um, you know, each person learns a little bit differently. I saw a bunch of uh, questions on the chat about uh, the standardized tests and how long do you study and what do you need to do? Um, so you kind of have to look inside, figure out what you need to do to understand the material so that you can perform your best. And that may be where for you, it's like two weeks or for others, it's may, maybe three months of concerted studying, 40 hours a week, what have you. Um, so you got to figure out what you need to get, you know, through that threshold and whether we like it or not, unfortunately, these numbers do matter. So you got to do our best and then, um, you know, fill in the gaps with, with other stuff that, um, that we need, such as shadowing and experience and things like that. Fantastic. Thank you so very much for all of you. Um, probably you already know this, but for many students, just listening to you can, can change their perspective and, and change their lives. So thank you so much for sharing your experience and your advice. Just want to share with the students that, of course, going to pre-med advisors, free health advisors is always helpful too. And there is one website for the National uh, Association of Advisors that provide one advisor for free for people, students who don't have an advisor in their schools. So take advantage of all these resources too. Thank you all very much. Thank you for being here. Thank you students. Thank you interpreters and everybody else. Thank you. Take Next care. Session. Stay well. Take care.